Coming up on DTNS, is Apple done for? Hope for data portability and a free streaming TV service, Locast, finally gets sued. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 31st, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Rocking and rolling in Salt Lake City. I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Sarah Lane is out today on another assignment. Uh, we wish her the best. We miss her. She will be back next week. Uh, but if you missed Good Day Internet, you missed us talking about the Kevin Costner verse, uh, along with cryptocurrency and much more. Get that and more at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Spotify added 8 million subscribers last quarter. That missed estimates by a half million, but Spotify says monthly active users grew 7% to 232 million and paid subscribers grew 9% to $108 million. Due to free trials and discount promotions, however, the average revenue per user fell 1% since last quarter to €4.86. Spotify reported a revenue rise of 31% over last year. That narrowed its operating loss down to $3.34 million. Analysts had expected them to lose 62, so that's better. Spotify has reached new licensing deals with two of the four major record labels, with active talks ongoing with the other two. And Spotify's podcast audience grew more than 50% since last quarter still pretty new still doing good dji announced new first person view or fpv goggles a high definition camera and transmitter uh, the fpv experience kit includes goggles two transmitters and two cameras for 819 dollars us the fly more kit includes a phantom style controller the goggles and one transmitter and one camera for 929 the kits can stream 720p video at 120 or 60 frames per second with a latency of 28 milliseconds at a range of up to 2.5 miles. Drone racers, check it out. Yeah. Uh, Samsung reported its profit fell 56% last quarter as memory chip prices declined due to oversupply. In fact, Samsung's head of investor relations, Robert Yi, warned that trade restrictions, not just between the US and China, but also between Korea and Japan, uh, are going to mean, quote, we no longer believe it is possible to reasonably predict or forecast our free cash flow for 2018 through 2020. Samsung projected its NAND chip inventories will start to come down. That should help ease the price pressure. And it reported server customers are buying more DRAM and they expect that to continue. Operating profit for Samsung's chip division fell 71% and profit for mobile fell 42% over last year. Uh, well, Chrome 76 has decided to make some news today. It's launched on Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS. It now blocks Flash by default. That is to say Adobe Flash, for those maybe not in the know. Users can turn Flash back on, its, or on in its settings if they want to, but keep in mind that Flash will uh, have its full support removed entirely from Chrome next year. So they're taking it all out. This right now is temporary. going to be gone for good then. Chrome 76 also prevents websites from knowing if you're using incognito mode. And an install button from uh, Progressive Web Apps now shows up in Omnibox, or in the Omnibox, I should the say. The spirit of 76. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more about Apple. We gave you the, the hard numbers yesterday, but uh, refresh your memory. Apple reported revenue of $53.8 billion, up 1% year over year, despite revenue declines in Europe and China. iPhone revenues uh, overall fell 12% from $26.5 billion last year to $26 billion. That means, if you're doing the math in your head, that iPhone now makes up less than half of Apple's revenue. And that's the first time it's been that way in seven years. Services, which is Apple's new hope, grew 12.6% year over year to $11.45 billion. And Apple says they have 420 million paid subscribers across all offerings. So Apple Music, iCloud, et cetera, et cetera, driven by strong growth of the app store in China. So even if they're not making the revenue in China based off the phones, they are still making some money off the App Store there, and that helped drive services growth. Uh, other categories like wearables, iPad, and Mac each contributed about $5 billion to revenue. Apple also noted a 50% increase in monthly users of its TV app and reported that Apple Pay doubled since last year to almost reach 1 billion transactions per month. So all of that's going well. Apple said that despite slowing phone sales, its install base of phones is higher than ever including a rise in the install base in China. And if you're like, well, wait a minute, if they're not selling as many phones, how's that possible? Well, they say customer loyalty. Uh, people keep their iPhones. They don't trade them in for other things. They just keep them longer. And a strong aftermarket. 
So the people who do get rid of their iPhones are selling them to other people, uh, and that's that's continuing to go. And Apple seems to be okay with that because they want to sell those people services. Next quarter, Apple will have more services to report. Apple Card is going to launch in August, according to Tim Cook. And of course, uh, we already know that Apple TV Plus and Apple Arcade are going to launch in the autumn. And uh, we're probably going to get new iPhone models, at least announced, maybe not for sale, but at least announced uh, by the end of the next quarter. So they'll they'll have a few possibilities to drive revenue up. And if those phone models do go on sale before the end of the quarter, that will boost iPhone iPhone revenue. We'll see if it brings it back up above 50%. But it, I look at this, Scott, and I think this is Apple doing what they say they need to do. They know the phone market worldwide is is uh, slowing and they're going to make that up with services. And so we see phone revenue declining, not precipitously, not falling off a clip, but declining as expected. And we see services revenue coming up. Uh, it's not outperforming. It's not going gangbusters, but at least it's going in the right direction. Uh, and their revenue was flat, you know, up 1% year over year is pretty much flat. Yeah, I, I actually have a theory I don't know how much water it holds. <clears throat> Clearly, they know what was coming or that, you know, they've talked about this for a while, about services being beefed up, slowing in the market of phones, blah, blah, blah. That all makes sense to me. But I have this theory. Tim Cook's gotten up on multiple uh, uh, occurrences where he's been on stage and said, we know you're keeping your phones longer. Oh, by the way, we have a reporting tool that will tell you how much time you spent in what apps on what on which phone and how long. Uh, also, we're going to do some things with battery to make your older phones last longer. Basically, they've said, we know you're keeping them longer. And so we're going to give you more services and abilities to use those phones longer. It's like they've embraced this idea mm -hmm. that people aren't going to necessarily buy a new phone every fall, year after year after year. I think for a while, obviously, that was the goal and people did. But they, they've they embraced that in a way that actually feeds the services side. So it's, it's a subtle message, but I actually think it worked for them. I mean, you could also cast the exact same thing you said as Apple noticed what people wanted right. uh, and responded to that market. Uh, we, we we tend to think that co corporations have all the power and just dictate what we do. But turns out, you know, people on Moss, maybe not each one of us individually, but but people as a, as a whole have an effect on companies too. And they're like, well, people are holding on their phones more often. Maybe we should move from making our money off of unit sales to making our money off of selling people services for the entire life of their phone. We're going to make more money that way. Well, speaking of Apple, they announced it will join the open source data transfer project, which is developing interoperable systems to let users move data between services. Uh, the aim is to allow direct transfer of data without having to export to a hard drive and then import into a new service. Uh, think iCloud and Dropbox and a million other services. The data transfer project includes Tim Berners-Lee Solid, uh, Mastodon, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, now Apple joins that consortium and I guess we'll see what they wanna do. If you have been following uh, DTNS closely, you know that I have been very bullish on the idea of open source data transfer. Uh, I've mentioned Tim Berners-Lee's Solid quote, several times as an example of a good project that if it can get momentum, uh, could provide what we want and solve a lot of these privacy issues. Because if it works and is adopted, you would control your data and you could withdraw consent to see it from people. Uh, and, and you wouldn't have as many of these concerns about, oh, my data's in a million places and I don't even know where it is, right? So seeing Apple join this, following on our Apple earnings uh, comments makes sense because they're like, well, we want to make it easy for people to join our service. And if that means letting them bring their Google photos in at the risk of also letting them take their Apple photos to Google, then so be it. Maybe that's a good idea. I did not realize Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter had already joined the data transfer project as well. They joined last summer. Uh, so this is it's not done by any stretch. It's not like, hey, we've solved the problem, but this is looking very positive. This is what you want to see is Apple joining with the others to say, yeah, okay, let's let's make it so that you can move your data between our different services. Uh, so then we can just compete on who has the better services rather than monopolizing the data. It also makes sense for Apple because Apple says, we don't want to monetize you. We just want to sell you services. Right. I think that is, uh, I, I agree 100% across the board. And it reminds me of other changes that are happening. The video game industry is experiencing this a little bit, but not so much with data but with universal logins via multiple platforms, playing over those multiple platforms, like this is the same kind of battleground or not battleground, but this is a, this is a, a place where companies are finally starting to figure out ways to be more interoperable and compete 
on on actual products and services and not on those on restrictions or how much of a pain it would be to switch a service. Uh, I really like that. I feel like that actually is pro competitive and happy to see them join and anxious to see what these guys all come up with. Yeah, I I, I am too. And then if it was just the companies joining, I'd be like, oh, okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, but the fact that it's got Timberly solid, the fact that it's got Mastodon gives me hope that maybe this is this is for real. And you need all of those. You need you need the open source projects and you need the the big companies to make this work. Yep. All right, let's talk about reading your mind. A team led by neurosurgeon Edward Chang at the University of California, San Francisco, funded by Facebook Reality Labs, published in the journal Nature Communications that it had developed a brain computer interface that can decode words and phrases, both heard and spoken in real time. Now, this isn't a product. This is, we're watching someone speak and we're looking at our, our machine learning uh, algorithm to see if it is correctly saying, yeah, that's what they're saying, right? So it's a cheat right now. But the question is, can they actually do it? And they can. The process decodes two kinds of information from two different parts of the brain to increase the accuracy. They're adding context. So a machine learning algorithm uses the activity in the brain to determine, is a person listening or are they speaking? Then the algorithm uses context of what the patient heard to determine what sound is being imagined. So if there's two sounds that are looking very similar in the, in the speech cortex, they can use the context of what was asked to figure out which of those it is. That's gonna help the machine learning algorithm get better, of course, in the, in the future. And the system right now can decode perceived sound, what you hear, 76% of the time, and produced sound, spoken speech, 61% of the time. Hmm. Granted, this is a restricted set of questions and answers. Uh, the aim of the research is to restore speech in stroke or spinal cord injury patients, and the next steps are to improve the algorithms and widen the vocabulary that the system can understand. So it's early, early days. But you might have noticed that I mentioned this is funded by Facebook Reality Labs, and what Facebook wants to do is get this tech up to speed so it can put it into augmented reality headsets so that you can control them by thinking. Yeah, hundred percent that. And, uh, you know, prosthe uh, prosthesis that you could have for a missing leg or something. Uh, there's huge application for this uh, and your, your brain can kind of go crazy. It doesn't just stop with, with the immediate, uh, uh, discussion of what the research is for. It goes really far and wide. And I, really like this sort of stuff and i would argue i would argue even though those questions are limited and it's not like these statements are super complex 76 and 61 percent is a really strong showing for uh for the potential of this thing. Right. It, it's it's so, it's so tempting to just go like yeah okay they're reading your mind but right. you know what they it's a restricted set i mean yeah but they're reading your mind right <laughs> right like, right it's better yeah. yeah get excited about a thing because this seems like science fiction made real uh, everything starts uh, poorly. I mean, I say things to my echo these days that if I'd have told you 20 years ago I was going to be able to do one day, you would have laughed me out of the room. So small steps, baby steps, we'll get there. And uh, the idea of being able to, for me to be able to think things and have things happen outside of my normal body processes is so exciting. I'm ready for my chip, I guess is what I'm saying. Let's go. Yeah, and, and right now this is UCSF researchers. This right. is uh, meant for medical use. But with Facebook funding it, we are absolutely going to have a lot of controversy uh, once Facebook starts to try to make use of this about Facebook reading your thoughts. You think people overreacted to the idea of Facebook setting up an independent cryptocurrency? <laughs> Imagine Facebook taking this research and saying, OK, we've got a way to read your mind, like uh, get get ready for for people to flip out. Yeah. Uh, next level. If, if that if Facebook is still around by the time this gets perfected, which yeah. this is not going to be perfected soon it's going right. to take a few years get on board for the long haul everybody yeah, yeah. uh security researcher beto on security nothing to do with the current presidential candidate noticed that the netflix app on android requested access to his physical activity data meaning your you know what, like, what your phone saying netflix your wanted to know if he's swimming or biking or right. <laughs> it's a very weird thing to want to know what your accelerometer is doing uh as a service that just gives you movies and tv but anyway netflix told the next web quote this this was part of a test to see how we could improve video playback quality when a member is on the go, uh, in a car, in a 
train, I guess, uh, at the gym running uh, at a treadmill. Well, for activity data, yeah, it would be at the gym running, swimming, et cetera. Yeah. Sure, sure. So not all Netflix <laughs> accounts. Are watching are. Netflix while they're swimming. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, you could. I mean, you could. Right, you get you get enough waterproof stuff, I guess. You sort of. I guess you could it. listen. You could have it off to the side while you're swimming. You're listening to David Letterman interview somebody. Yeah, it's very weird. But anyway, not all Netflix accounts uh, are in on the test, and Netflix doesn't have any rollout plans at this time. So don't worry, it's not coming to you anytime fast. Android Q has added an activity recognition permission to Android Q to let de developers uh, know you're in motion when you're using the app. This could be used to help figure the best way to buffer video so it doesn't skip. As an example. Uh, I still find this a little head scratchy. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I don't buy their reasons. Um, they, they have the, the money and the, and the desire to, to test all sorts of use case questions and, and whatever. And I think they should probably do some of that. Um, and they certainly ask you first, you can say no. Yeah, right. This is part of Android where you give the app permission. It's not stealing it. So, it's just yeah. an odd thing to ask me though, for a well, video. You gotta tell me on why, because I, I, you're not asking me, like you said, to be on a train. Right. Right? right, like, oh, are you? Can can you let us know if you're if you're moving on a train? I mean, I guess that given the accelerometer would would let them know that. But I, I feel like the optimization of video while moving is a real thing. But it feels like you only really can make a difference if you're trying to optimize it while I'm in a car or a train or something going high speed. Right. I mean, I run pretty slow. Other people run fast. They still don't run fast enough to like flip from cell tower to cell tower every couple of seconds. So what exactly is necessary? Like also if I'm running on a track or if I'm swimming uh, or if I'm cycling in place, does that matter? I mean, it feels like they just want to know what activities people are doing while they're watching video, but that's not what they're saying. What they right. do next web is they want to improve video playback quality. Right. And they, they also didn't say, I mean, they they just straight up didn't say it. So I don't know if they could say it, but this isn't saying that they're going to, you know, this is, they're not taking this data and saying, well, we're going to make a whole bunch of exercise uh, video. Right. Gonna, you know, like they didn't say that either. So, so for me, none of the use cases seem that, that, I have no problem with Netflix having that information if they ask for it. Like, hey, can we know about your activity so we can decide what videos are great for people while they're working out? I'd be fine with that if it's all above board, but they're saying it's for video playback quality. And that's the part. I know we have people out there who work in, in video streaming. Uh, let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you're like, oh, no, the legitimate reason you might want to do that for activity is X, because I'm not quite seeing it. Yeah, me neither. Lowcast, uh, poor Lowcast. Lowcast, if you don't know, is a free donation supported internet service that operates in 14 cities right now in the United States, streaming local broadcast stations over the internet only in their home markets. And you're like, wait, didn't Aereo get run out of business for that? Well, there's the difference. Aereo was a for profit company. Sports Fans Coalition New York, which started Lowcast, is a nonprofit operation and is taking advantage of a 1976 law that lets nonprofits retransmit broadcast signals as long as the nonprofit does not receive any, and I quote, direct or indirect commercial advantage. So Locast is saying, we're, we're taking donations for, from people to cover the cost of operations. We're not making any money off this. All we're trying to do is make it available on the internet for people to watch their local broadcast if they live in a building where the broadcast isn't very good, et cetera, et cetera. It started in New York by people who wanted to watch sports games mm. uh, that were broadcast over the air. Now, it's operated for a year and a half. And finally, as we all knew what happened, ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC have jointly filed a lawsuit against Locast. The suit alleges that Locast has admitted it is used to help authorized services negotiate lower carriage fees with broadcasters. I don't know if Lowcast has admitted it, but Charter did. Charter said, hey, uh, we're in a carriage dispute with broadcast stations. Go use Lowcast. They're free. Yeah. The suit also alleges that Lowcast is securing commercial advantages in the form of nationwide app distribution and collection of viewer data uh, and points to AT&T and DISH as being commercial beneficiaries. Now, remember what I said, the law says you can't have direct or indirect commercial advantage as part of your operation. The suit is saying that AT&T and DISH are getting commercial advantage from Locast. So it's kind of flipping the language of the law on its head a little bit. And also 
the commercial advantage that AT&T is alleged to get is that AT&T gave money to Locast, which it did, yeah. uh, and in return has included the Locast app on the DirecTV and Uverse set-top boxes, which anybody can do. I have the Locast app on my Apple TV. Locast founder David Goodfriend also used to work for Dish, and that appears to be the commercial advantage that somehow Dish gets is that a former employee has started Locast. I think they're trying to imply like, oh, Dish told him to go do this so that they could get better negotiations. It's all about negotiating carriage fees. I have no idea if you could convince a judge that Locast is illegal under this, but I know that this gives you the shakes, Scott, as someone who loved Aereo, and yeah. Aereo, which was for profit and went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yeah, saying you have a million antennas doesn't really exempt you from having to pay a carriage fee. Uh, how do you how do you feel about this? I know Locast isn't available for you, but but does it bother you? Well, I mean, I'd heard about it and got excited about it because it seemed like a cool solution and immediately was reminded of Aereo, like immediately. I was like, oh, that thing, it's like that kind of, except maybe better because this is not for profit and maybe this will come here and I can't freaking wait and I can finally cancel cable for the, all the other reasons I want to cancel it. And uh, I already canceled cable. I guess I have direct TV for free right now with a phone deal I got. But anyway, I, I just, I would really like local programming in this way. And now I feel the same burn as I did last time. It's not going to happen, probably. I mean, they have to win this suit, uh, I guess. But that's ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC. They've got deep pockets. They have lawyers uh, willing to go the distance. Yeah. Uh, you've got Disney, day. CBS, Fox, and Universal. Or yeah. Comcast, in the case of NBC. Yeah. How do you fight that? Because Comcast is also benefiting from Locast on its cable business. So. Well, and that's the other thing I wanted to say real quick. The idea of the direct or indirect uh, commercial advantage thing, the law that they're they're sort of using as the reason they should be able to operate in this way. Uh, it's so different now than it was in 76. And I and I don't mean just the times have changed. I mean, collection of data is everywhere all the time on any service. And if you're a nonprofit, you're still doing that. And that stuff is perceived and or maybe legally recognized as commercial advantage because now you have yeah. names and names are money. Uh, contact information matters. Like, I don't know how they thought they would get away with that particular squeeze by without getting some heat. So like you said, we probably knew the suit. Oh, they didn't. Uh, in fact, in, in interviews, uh, David Goodfriend has said, yep, we've been preparing for this. We knew we knew this would happen. Uh, you know, we've been digging in our heels. I guess the dots they're trying to connect is AT&T gave money and a former Dish employee founded this. So they're going to try to convince the judge, this is AT&T and Dish creating something that they get commercial advantage from. They're going to have to establish that AT&T and Dish are responsible for Locast. Then they can say, and Locast indirectly provides a commercial advantage to them. But whether you can say that AT&T giving them a donation and whether you could say a former employee founding something makes them responsible for it, I think is a tall order. We'll yeah, see. I think I agree. Uh, all right, moving on to a tablet bit of news. No, it's not an iPad. Samsung announced the 10.5-inch Super AMOLED uh, Samsung Galaxy Tabs S6 tablet with a Snapdragon 855 processor up to 15 hours of charge and an S Pen charges wirelessly and attaches magnetically to the back. Uh, the Tab S6 also has a rear dual-lens camera with a new, or sorry, with a built-in neural processing unit for scene optimization and optical uh, fingerprint reader that is built directly into the screen. The Tab S6 sells for $649 with six gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage for 729 or eight gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage. Uh, let's see, they don't have the price. Oh no, that's sorry. Six gigabytes and 729 for eight gigabytes. Uh, Pre-order start August 23rd, so that's coming right up. Uh, as a, uh, I use a tablet all the time now. Uh, my current tool of choice is an iPad Pro, a pencil, and uh, some art software that I think is crucial for anyone creating art and design these days. I was talking pre-show about um, the, the the artist who currently works on the Captain Marvel series for Marvel, not the movie, but the, the comics, is doing the entire process in an iPad Pro with a pencil and uh, Procreate, which is um, also amazing. And it's kind of become a tool du jour for artists and illustrators everywhere. And I've said this on the show a few times. Uh, what I would really like, so that Apple keeps making good stuff, is for all these guys to keep competing in this space. And I think... Samsung, if anybody, would have the ability to do it, given that they're the only ones that seem to really be spending a lot of time in tablets since uh, Google seems to have pulled away a bit and focused more on Chromebooks. Uh, so that's what I would need to see here. 
I would need to see their commitment to my particular need for me to get super jazzed about it. Uh, but I also think that the tablet market needs competitive alternatives. And right now there really aren't very many. So this is good for everybody. I just, it, whether or not it's a tool I can use or not, I guess I need to see when this thing hits and we get some reviews and stuff. It's all about that S Pen for you, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And uh, Samsung also has their Dex ability, uh, which is the ability to to turn this thing into a a more uh, laptop desktop type experience, where you can have multiple windows and everything. And that's built into this as well. But that's that's less of an issue for the artist in you. I know, like yeah. And I should mention that, like I realize my I have a I have a very um, you know specific corner that I'm aimed at here. And and I and I'll fully admit that there are there's a million things people are doing with their tablets these days, iPad or not. And so I'm not really thinking about any of that. Surely this is going to be great at watching video and it's going to be great at flicking through my news feeds and all the other things tablets are great at. Uh, and even more so in docked mode. Like that stuff's gonna be awesome. Can I create a beautiful painting on it? I don't know. Yeah. Like I just need to find out. So I guess I just shout out to the other artists, keep your eye on this one. It's possible. I'm still holding off for Microsoft Surface to get better. Like we have options. It's just, uh, you know, it's just good to see Samsung sticking to that market and throwing some love its way. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, although today was like six minutes, I guess I read slow. Uh, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Also, big thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Michael from Suddenly Summer, Yokohama here. I hope you're keeping cool, Michael. Uh, they, they've been having a major heat wave in Japan. The first purpose I thought that the Soli radar in the new Pixel 4 phones would serve is interpreter for the deaf says Michael. If you don't remember, Soli is the chip that Google says it'll put in the Pixel 4. They'll be able to read your hand gestures so you can control the phone without touching it. Michael says your description of the technology a month or so ago screamed accessibility feature with precision to distinguish finger gestures. And why invent a whole new gesture vocabulary when such a language already exists? Granted, it'll need to be translated to the various sign languages that correspond to spoken languages, since there's not one single sign language for the world, but they've already got the Google Assistant working for those spoken languages. I remember learning a little bit of sign language in elementary or middle school in the 1970s, and I don't recall if it was part of school or not, but like many of the accessibility functions on computers and phones, some of these things leak out to the general population as they are handy. Get it? Sign language handy. Mm. I imagine that such functionality could initialize a revolution in tech for the deaf. I don't know anyone who is deaf personally, so this speculation may be way off. But when you first talked about it, I recall hearing the word accessibility leading me to think it was for sign language. I was sure that if Allison was on the show, she'd have pointed that out too. Yes, she, she would have. The air-conditioned shirt on Monday's show caught my interest as well, looking into it. As always, take care. Yeah, Michael, if you uh, get that get that shirt next year, uh, let us know how well it works. And great, great point. The Soli radar demos have been much more precise than the one that they discussed for the Pixel 4. I imagine that has to do with maybe power consumption or, or the uh, the amount of uh, space they want to put in the chip uh, somehow. But but it does seem like the Pixel 4 is a little less precise. But those finger gestures that it can do in the demos, man, that's uh, you could you could definitely have a phone that recognizes sign language for sure. Cool. Yeah. Love it. Well, thank you, Scott Johnson, as always, for being with us. Uh, what you got going on to tell folks? About? Oh, man, uh, a lot of stuff. So I have, this, I have this game that I've been making called Space Rocks Incorporated. It's a card game. And I've been working on it for a long time. And then I found out that uh, uh, an internet friend and someone who a lot of people probably know, Gary Witta, has a game that he's working on called Space Rocks. And I went, oh, shoot, <laughs> I don't know about this. Well, let's change it around. So now it's called Rock Runners Incorporated. But the game's pretty much the same. Anyway, I'm this close to launching it. So sometime before the end of the week, there will be a web link up. It's not up yet, but it will be. So write this down or remember it or make fun of me for doing it now before it's up. But the address is going to be frogpants.com slash rocks. And uh, on that page, I will have details about the game, how it works, how it's played, uh, some images of the actual card game. I have another sample coming to me in the next couple of days. I'm very excited about it. It's a thing I've wanted to do for a very long time. So if you have any interest in that, uh, check that out. And in the meantime, you can also follow all my goings on, including that over on Twitter at Scott Johnson. 
Folks, 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 uh, we are an independent organization. We are not beholden to anyone but you, and we want to keep it that way uh, to stay independent. We're one of the only independent tech voices, probably the only independent daily tech voice out there at all, uh, which means when we're thinking on all sides of the issue like we like to do, we're doing it because we want to. We're not doing it because we think it's the best thing for our masters. So if you want to keep us that way, uh, the only way to do, help us be sure of that is to support us on Patreon. We try to do some things to thank you for that support. But the biggest thing we do is this show and thanks for that support. So help us out at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Send us an email. We're also live on Twitch. Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. All you got to remember is dailytechnewsshow.com slash live to go there to watch us. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>